Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we are continuing our look into the life of Job through the book of Job, and today we find ourselves in chapter 14. Now, before we begin, I woke up this morning, and I certainly was feeling the pains of a 50-year-old body. Now, I know many of you are 60, maybe even in your 70s, and you said, son, you're young. You have no idea what is to come, and you're probably right. Nonetheless, even at this moment, I feel the pains of a 50-year-old body, and yet, when I turn my mind upon the things of the Lord Jesus, when I approach the Word of God, when I sit down to do these videos with you, it's like a man coming out of the desert, thirsty and dirty, and discovering a spring, maybe even a waterfall that is just rushing down and being able to stand underneath those cleansing waters, those refreshing waters. That's how I feel, friends, when I come to the Word of God. That's how I feel when I come to the teaching of others, teaching the pure, unadulterated, uncompromised Word of God, how refreshing it is to my soul, and I pray that it is yours as well. And so with that being said, I trust that you are feeling blessed today, blessed by the mighty God whom we serve. With joy in your hearts and praise upon your lips, together the people of God again say, Hallelujah, hallelujah to the great and mighty God we serve. Well, we are in, as I said, Job chapter 14, and let me preface this by saying we have to keep in mind that this is a man who lived around the time of Abraham. He, he may have been alive when Adam was alive, when Noah was alive. We really don't know. But if that was the time, and many theologians believe it is so, if that was the time when he lived, he didn't have the Old Testament. He didn't have the writings of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. He didn't have any of the historical books, the Psalms, the Proverbs. He certainly didn't have the New Testament. He had what had been handed down to him by his forefathers about God's work among men on earth who we were as a people, where we came from. And so when we read this, we have to be very careful not to throw stones at Job because Job doesn't have a lot of information to go on. Now I say all that because we notice in chapter 14, verse one, Job begins by saying, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And so basically Job is saying, Man's days are short upon the earth, but his troubles are many. And the older we get, the more we know that to be true. The older we become, the more scarred our heart. Not only because of the things that we have suffered in this life, but because of our own self-examination. The older we become, the more aware we become of our potential for sin. And we begin to outline the sin. We begin to discover the sin in a very minute way. We're not focused upon murder and rape and the things that we would consider the larger sins, but we see in ourselves deception. We see in ourselves self-righteousness. We see in ourselves the desire to justify ourselves and our sins. We see in ourselves self-exaltation. And so we're not as focused upon the things that others are doing, but we're examining ourselves down to the finest detail, and we see how frail and empty, how proud and how sinful we actually are. And that's where Job continues. He says, man comes forth like a flower in verse 2. He is cut down. He flees as a shadow, and he does not continue. So basically, Job is saying here today, gone tomorrow. Our life upon this earth is very short when you look at it in the grand scheme of things. And that being so, how can you, a holy God, even look upon us? How can you recognize us? How can you pass on to us any favor? Look what he says in verse 3. Dost thou open thine eyes upon such a one and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing 
out of an unclean. In other words, we are so unclean, we are so sinful, we are so unworthy that it is absolutely impossible to purify us. Now again, Job doesn't have the many promises and the information that we have where we know that what is impossible with men is possible with God. That God promised to give us a new heart. That God promised that old things would be passed away and new things would come. Job doesn't know any of this. And so he's looking upon himself in his own depravity and he's saying, how can you, how can anyone cleanse me? For as pure as I set myself before you in obedience, I'm still a wicked man at the core of my heart. And Job both realizes this and he acknowledges it. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Job continues in the next few verses addressing the issue of how short man's life is upon the earth. And once it's over, it's over, which eliminates any possibility of reincarnation. Look at verse 12. Man lies down and does not rise again. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Now, we've done other videos on this, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But when we die, friends, we don't go to heaven and we don't go to hell. Those are either final rewards or final judgment that will be pronounced on the day of judgment. We go into the grave in a state of rest. We're asleep. That's why Paul says those who are dead in Christ, who are sleeping in Christ, they will rise first. But in verse 16, Job continues with his original thought. He says, for now you number my steps. For now, you number my steps. While I'm on earth, you are in control. As long as I allow you to lead the way, you guide my steps. Do you not watch over my sin? My transgressions are sealed up in a bag, and you sew up mine iniquity. In other words, as I humbly come before you, my God and my King, and I make confession unto you of my failures, shortcomings, and sins, you seal them up, never to be brought up again, never to be remembered again. Remember what he told us in chapter 13 and verse 23? He says, how many are mine iniquities, O God? How many are my sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. You know, friends, this is something that we don't often do, but I want to ask you to do this. I want you to take a piece of paper. And I want you to go back to your earliest memory. And I want you to write down every sin, every act of disobedience, even if it wasn't an act of, of rebellion against God, but it was a simple desire to do what you want to do instead of what God wanted you to do. It was an act of rebellion against authority. I want you to write down every single sin that you can remember upon a piece of paper. Now, the first time, it may take many pages for some of us, but the first time you do this, you're going to get about 75% of the things that you have done in your life on that piece of paper. This may take days. It may take weeks. But as time progresses, if you'll keep that notebook handy and close by, and every time something comes to your mind that you have forgotten, but all of a sudden you remember, go back and write it down. Because by doing this, you're going to see the gravity of your sin, the weight of your sin, and what God has done for you. The price that Jesus paid for you. Now, if you take all of your sins, as heavy as they may be, and you compile that by the millions of people throughout time that have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus, you'll start to sense the heavy price that was paid upon that old rugged cross. You see, it's important for us to do this because that's what Job is doing. He's taking inventory of his life. He's in a moment of self-examination trying to discover why this is coming upon him. What has he done that is so deserving? And friends, it only takes one to experience the wrath of God, to break fellowship with God. And yet, if you're like me, page after page after page of sin and rebellion against the Most High, you will find in your list. And I would encourage you often to go back to that list and look at that list and then lift your hands in praise and adoration 
because he has forgiven those sins. If you've called upon him, he has forgiven those sins, sealed them in a bag. The Bible tells us, tossed them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again, never to be brought up against you because of the price that Jesus paid for you and your sins. Oh, how he loves you, friend. Oh, how he sees the potential in what you can become. You'll have to forgive me. I can't remember his name, but there was a man long ago who was about to be burnt at the stake for his love for Jesus. And they told him, if you'll simply deny the one you claim to love and serve, you will walk away and not one stitch of your garments will be set ablaze. And he simply looked upon his prosecutors and said, how can I deny him now? He who has been so faithful and true to me, never turned his back on me, never failed me and never let me down. How could I possibly turn against him now? And that's what it all boils down to, friends. Our perspective of things, our perspective is to be upon the God whom we serve, the kingdom which he rules, the promises which he has given, not our circumstances in this life. And so we too, as Job, shall say, as he said in chapter 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Oh, hallelujah, friends. Dear God of heaven, please do a work in our hearts and give us the courage, the dedication, the motivation, and the relationship that so many have had with you. Grant that to us so we may live faithfully for you in the greatest heat of the battle each and every day. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you're again here with us. I pray the word of God is having an effect in your life and that you are being transformed into the man, the woman, the boy, the girl that God has called you, created you, and designed you to be. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I do love you, and I'll see you on the next video.